Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Kurt Squire. All right, so we're gonna talk about video games for a little bit. Um, hopefully that's not the worst thing. Um, and I, I want us to briefly go back in time. Now this may cause some pain, but if you go back three years ago, almost to the day, this is kind of crazy, but if you go back three years ago, almost the day, this is right about when schools were starting to close. I don't know if people have thought about this at all. But um, I want you to think back, to, uh, particularly for the students here, what it was like being in school uh, God, God, it's bringing me, bringing me back bad, bad memories um, of being during the pandemic, right? And, th and thinking about how quickly that happened. I want you to think, and then if you're a parent or anyone else who helps support during this time, think about all the stuff that went into this, right? So here was my kid at the time. He's grown immensely since then. Um, Luckily, I guess in California, you can mostly sit outside and <laughs> do school. But uh, I bet there are others here who have memories of doing this, right? Of just sitting in front of Zoom calls with Canvas up and yeah, yeah, yeah. going through workbooks, right? And then as a parent, you're like, am I in, in, in a meeting, out of a meeting? Do you need, is the internet breaking again? What do I got to do? It's so, oh, just, so think back to those times. Um, and this was his planner. And what was interesting to me, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later on as well, is that he had in many ways already been socialized to do this. So we're over in Irvine in a you know, pretty affluent school district. And the way that we had, they had everything set up or he already had routines and knew how to ask us for stuff, had a place to work. It was kind of like, all right, we're just going online, but we're doing the same kinds of things you already did. Um, you can see here he's got like, you know, turning it in various meetings and all the to-do list all set up. And what got me, uh, and granted, we were all in sort of panic mode at the time. I mean, we were, I, I was certainly as a teacher, I was doing the exact same things in my college classes, like throwing lecture slides up, being on Zoom and just saying, oh, when's this thing going to end? Um, <clears throat> but what was interesting is someone who's been developing and studying games for education, we didn't really use any of these technologies that we have, right? I very rarely, I heard a couple of stories of like Minecraft EDU, but not much of people really embracing games. And in some ways, this would have been the real time to do it. Again, if you keep in mind that, if you leave aside for a second that we were all in panic mode and just trying to get by, um, this would have been a perfect opportunity to do this. Um, and if you were like me, your feelings on Zoom is you got left afterwards going, oh, that was you know, just horrible. I felt even more disconnected from people than beforehand. Um, a lot of kids, I have a, a friend who teaches in Santa Ana, and she said a lot of her kids you know, weren't even really showing up or they, they didn't have they didn't have those parental supports and someone kicking them in the butt and setting everything up and making it so they could do it. So some of them weren't even going online. But then in the meantime, what people would do the moment they got off of Zoom was like, great, it's time to game, right? So everyone, remember Among Us was like the thing, right? Uh, everyone else played Raft, that was a really big thing. Um, and that was kind of what saved a lot of people's sanity, um, right? So the games were places that we went. Well, again, while we had very little feeling of co-presence, you know, we're kind of like, ah, oh, being drained. The moment you could get on, get on a game, you had the feeling of being together, being in a shared place, doing something with a common goal, being with people. Um, uh, and really tying a lot of this together was Discord. So I think to the extent that during pandemic, you even had a sense of, oh, I'm with people or, or together in a, in a classroom, it was probably because you had a Discord window up and you were either uh, close your ears, teachers, you know, either sharing answers or do, uh, using Discord to provide that sen common sense of place, right? Um, but and we, meanwhile, we use games like uh, Minecraft, right? So there were graduation ceremonies being held in Minecraft. Some of you may have. Um, uh, people like using things like Fortnite, right? For um, having online concerts. Um, there was a game Plague Inc. I don't know if anyone out here played it. Yeah, all right, yeah. Um, again, kind of interesting that this game uh, is an epidemiology game where you are, of course, in this game, you are the virus. You're trying to wipe out the human race. Um, <laughs> Um, it's, I think it's now funny again. It maybe wasn't so funny. They actually had, um, th it was pulled for a while, right, due to this. But it's, it's actually in the top 10 games of all time on the um, iOS, if you're not familiar. So also kind of interesting, the developer has been, br before the pandemic, had been flown down, um, flown down to the um, CDC to give them a lecture on how could you learn to engage the public in, in science because here's a game that's, I want to say the revenue's in the billion dollar range. It's, ab it's absolutely huge. It was made by one guy. So he's, he's doing quite well now. Um, 
And then the other thing, of course, we did for fun and, and emotional support was many of us went to Animal Crossing. Um, and what was interesting about this, um, so the, again, interesting thing, we went to games for a sense of coziness, comfort, um, but you also had the social interactions around it. So this Twitter thread, which is one of my favorite things ever, the Museum of English Rural Life, if you don't know it, you should look it up. It's a little teeny museum in the corners of rural England that has an, an amazing social media person. And they had a smock design contest. So the contest was to design a smock like rural people would have worn in England, you know, um, really 50 years ago on, on back. And the internet, of course, delivered with people designing all of these smocks in Animal Crossing during the pandemic to share their love for smocks in a simpler time, right? So you have all this social interaction around games happening. Um, now, the things that we saw happening, as, for me as a social science researcher or as a games researcher, are that games are giving us a sense of place, right? They're a place you can go, or like Discord's a place you can go. I never really said that about Canvas. I mean, you might say I log on to Canvas, you might go into Canvas, but you weren't really there with other people because you didn't really know who else is online. You couldn't see who's working on what problems. You're just kind of there posting stuff. And, and if you're a science educator, um, you might already be familiar with some of this work. Um, Jay Lemke is probably the most famous science educator for doing this, who's observed that most of what we do in secondary onward, not all, um, but a lot of it is a teacher or someone else presenting information largely from a book that goes to students who then work on it. They think about it, they write back answers, and they spit it back onto a site like Canvas, right? Um, but there isn't a lot of open-ended problem solving. Um, there isn't a lot of trying to apply what you're knowing to doing investigations and things like that. Um, uh, so you, you don't have those kinds of opportunities through things like Canvas, say. So there wasn't this feeling of you really being together, of knowing who else is there. You're just kind of on your own, again, unless you have Discord open. Um, so. Um, I'm using this as an entree to think about what are some of the kinds of things that we can do with games and how, what are some of the ways that we can use this technology for science education. Um, so some of the things that we see are there are ways to, there are places, there are places you can go, ways to socialize, comfort and restoration. These were all during the pandemic. Um, but what I've been interested in doing is how can we use these same kind of principles for really improving science education? Now, a lot of our thinking on this, if you're interested, there's an excellent report, I guess it's over 10 years, almost 15 years now, um, the, info, the Learning Sciences in Informal Context, that's a National Academies uh, published it. And it really talks about how science education is more than just under even conceptual understanding, certainly more than memorizing or more than conceptual understanding, but it's also be coming to think of yourself as a scientist, coming to uh, affiliate with the whole, pro the whole production of science. Uh, one way you can, th I think this is something else we saw during the pandemic, right? Where there were a lot of people who are deeply suspicious of science are saying, well, science is not something, you, and certainly like the institution of science is not something you can trust. We know we can't, we have to be careful because they don't have our sort of interests at heart. Um, and what this book is saying is that's part of what we should be doing in science education is helping people understand what science is, right? The idea that you have this contesting over ideas, using the scientific method to try to arrive at the best understandings that we can, um, instead of saying, it's, oh, it's about mastering this one body of facts that you're then spitting back to an authority. So a lot of what we've tried to do in the game space is understand, can we use games to like motivate people to say, oh, science is interesting and cool. Look at all these good things you can do with science. Can you use tools to solve problems? Can you do virtual investigations? Can you start to think of yourself as like, oh, I could be a scientist, or I'm interested in science. This is something I really want to do. So these are some of the things that we're going to talk about today. Now, um, I'm going to gloss over some of the other stuff we've done uh, before I jump into two examples around environmental science. But I just want to give you a feel for the range of things that are out there. Um, this game, unfortunately, just got removed from the store because it's now out of date. But this is Virulent, a game where you are a virus trying to infect a, a host cell of the human body. Um, we've de developed games for mindfulness and meditation. Um, this is um, uh, Constance, my wife and collaborator, working with Richie Davidson, who's a neuroscientist, together with a, a Buddhist monk, where we, um, which was a lot of fun actually having him play iPad games. He's like, what is, what is this we're doing? Um, Matthew Ricard is his name. He's um, the happiest known person on record. When they scan his brain and when he you know, fills out various questionnaires, apparently he's like the happiest person they've found. Um, yeah, so we've designed games for um, like meditation apps. Uh, this one was for people on the autism spectrum, helping them 
um, under, re do facial recognition and, and sorry, uh, recognize expressions on faces. Um, we've since ported this to an Apple iWatch. If you're curious, I can um, show you, talk a little bit more about this. Our current work is actually building a VR version. One of my PhD students, Lika Liu, is building a, uh, a virtual reality uh, version that we're gonna look for use in, in hospitals and places like that. Um, we built some games around systemic racial bias. So this is a game where you are a student on college campus, and you come to understand some of the ways that we have forms of uh, racial bias. So this is um, an example from in the game, colorblind race, racial attitudes. Um, we've built some around healthcare. This is a, um, a, a cancer detection and contouring game that was a prototype developed by some former students of mine at uh, have a company called Filament Games. That has a fantastic suite of games if you're interested in games for science. But the idea behind this was that um, it would be interesting to have games where you would practice um, detecting cancer and then trying to treat it as a way to understand how the human body works, and then also as a way to, to introduce people to careers in science. So one of the ways I don't think we don't necessarily think about careers in science is all the medical technician fields, all the fields surrounding it. Um, this is um, CT scans and some of the uh, radiotherapies that are used. Um, we built um, a, a, a version for Facebook where you could get together. The goal was to have uh, youth studying uh, who might have interest in medical careers playing together with people in med school. That was kind of the big idea. We used it in some med school classes um, as a way to get them to, to think about how do you learn to contour and treat cancer. Um, the big idea behind this game, though, and, and many of ours, is can we create learning spaces where you get like professionals, the general public, medical training, and K-12 students in the same learning space? And I'll talk a little bit more about one of those in a second. Um, this work actually ended up going to DeVry. Um, they bought some of it for medical training, and so you can see just the, some of the ways that games are used, particularly in medical training. There's a lot. Um, this is a, a body voyage game. Um, it's an interesting side note, and I can talk more about this later. Um, they did later build a virtual donkey for teaching uh, anesthesiology. Um, in DeVry Medical School, when they teach anesthesiology, they fly you down to an island in the Bahamas, and I'm not joking. Um, you pra there's a field of donkeys that they practice anesthesia on. And so um, this can be very cruel to the donkeys if, if you don't do it well. So this was a virtual donkey to practice doing that before you got down there. Um, I guess they don't hurt the donkeys. It's a, it would be a, a, a lot of litigation in a bad situation if they did. But um, this was a kind of a, a supplement to doing that kind of training. Um, this, with this table you see there eventually made it to the New York Hall of Science. And so if you're interested, I think it's still there. There's a table that we built that is used for electricity and magnetism. Um, the last example I want to show you is a stem cell game that we built with Jamie Thompson, who's a, um, one of the two most famous stem cell researchers in the world. Um, he was in our lab. Uh, he was in the building on the side of the floor above us. These are his teammates that were working with us as um, researchers that were working with us to build a stem cell game. And in this game, there's been a zombie outbreak. And um, it would be very topical now with all the zombie shows. Um, and the idea is that you are engineering tissue to try to replenish you know, the human so you can fight back against a zombie invasion. Um, so the gameplay is a little bit tetris -y, but you're actually doing the same kind of work they do. So you're cultivating st cells stem cells that you then turn into tissue that then form organs, and then the idea is that you're repopulating. This is where it becomes science fiction, because th this part we don't know how to do. But you're essentially building spare parts for humans, is the idea. So you can see, like, in this one, so you're forming groups of red mesoderm cells and collecting them, just like you would with iPS cells, which is more or less the process that we use. So we had them sign off on this to say, all right, if this is what you're doing with stem cells, then you, know, you guys have the right to sign off and say this is accurate. And they said it was accurate enough. Um, I'll skip over that one. So if you're interested in any of this stuff, I've got a book called Making Games for Impact that gets into this in a little more depth. Um, but what I want to do is pivot and talk a little bit about environmental science. This is some of the work that I think where we've had some of the most success and I think where games make some of the most sense. Um, and I'm going to do two, two examples in depth and touch on a few more kind of in broad strokes and then we'll have some time for questions. Okay, so uh, if you've played video games, you've probably saved the world uh, many, many times, right? <laughs> you've saved the world from any number of, of bad things. Um, but in um, like an educational game, to the extent that they even exist, you know, you're mostly just spitting back answers or whatever. So we thought, wouldn't it be cool if there was a game where you are a kid, like just a normal person, but you actually do something that matters and that's important. So in this game, you're this 13 year old kid here and your mission is to save Lake Mendota. Now Lake Mendota is a real lake. It's a lake in Madison, Wisconsin. 
Um, in the very near future, Lake Mendota may become eutrophic. This is really a thing. And what eutrophic means is that essentially the algae becomes the dominant sort of pattern, where there's so much algae that light can't get through to the floor, so plants can't produce oxygen, and then the whole ecosystem basically collapses. Um, if you've been to the Salton Sea near here, that, that's what happened, um, mostly due to agricultural runoff, where the agricultural runoff gets so dense and that's so many, so many nutrients that the algae just takes off, it chokes the fish. Um, which is really stinky. If you go there, you've smelled it probably. Um, so essentially, in, in order to, to prevent the rest of um, the lakes in St. Madison becoming like the Salton Sea, what you've got to do is you've got to go back in time and uh, figure out why it became that way and then take, help take measures to fix the lake. So the initial quest is that you need to prevent a dog and a child from swimming and dying. This is a real thing. This can happen with blue-green algae. If you swim in a lake that is eutrophic and has a lot of blue-green algae, um, dogs and, and children can actually get sick and die. Um, so some blue-green algae was spotted in Lake Mendota. This is here in Madison. And so the idea is that we want kids to say, oh, wow, that's really a, a thing and why is that happening? It's from agricultural runoff. What's causing it? How does the how does um, how do fertilizers move throughout the watershed? Um, these are all science. Um, these are environmental science standards, kind of the fourth and fifth grade level. So what you do in the games, you go back in time to learn how the lake became that way. You then travel forward in time to study what's working as you try to improve the lake. So the idea is that if games let you try things, see what works, and then try new methods. What we wanted to do was build a game where you're traveling back and forth in time to try to try different strategies and see what's working. Um, there's the same lakes in downtown Madison, give you a sense for it. Um, this is, uh, it, it's a very, um, it's the center of the community, a little bit like if you live in Newport or Irvine, the Back Bay is a little bit similar in the way you've got a lot of people using it. Um, if you've ever learned anything about this, like you may have seen this at some point. It's a postcard that when it freezes, uh, people like to do stuff like this. People in Wisconsin are crazy. So yeah, this is the back bay here. So there, this is the, um, a similar kind of thing you might see. Now this is not a standing freshwater lake, right? This is a river going into the ocean. So it's a little different, a bit of an ecology, but you get a, a feel for what it might be like. The scientist we worked with was Steve Carpenter, who's a former president of the Ecological Society and National Academies member. And the thing he really impressed upon us is that there really isn't, it's not even useful to think in terms of natural states for these lakes. Um, what he wanted us to understand in terms of ecology are that they're all, all of these interrelated parts, right? What you do in one part of the ecosystem is going to affect the other. Um, but that all, for any water system with humans ends up being around water management. So a lot of times, you know, we get these arguments about, oh, should, should we, you know, can have like environmental concerns versus we need to use lakes. And he said, it, we're always using lakes and there are also are always environmental concerns, if that makes sense. Like water is, you know, we need water to live. Um, we're going to use it. it all, we, so we, we can't think of it in terms of only being pristine, but at the same time, um, you, we do obviously need to protect our, our resource, our water resources. So what we thought we would try to do, and this is where we were trying to push things forward a little bit, is say, you know, rather than in science class only learning in terms of what are the um, sort of the known standards. Let's also try to push some sort of activism or responsibility for the environment because th we need fresh water to survive, right? This is a, a shared resource that we all value. So the core game loop looks like this, if you know game terminology. Um, you start off talking to people. So you're this little kid here, right? You're talking to people about the lake, gathering evidence. We have virtual tools. So, you know, when you do lab experiments in school, unfortunately, you're usually doing what we call recipe uh, work, where you're like doing a list of things that, you know, a teacher or professor like me will give you things to do, then you follow the steps. Sometimes you're not sure why you're doing them. Um, the idea behind it here is that if you're using, this is a, called a secchi disk, if you're using a secchi disk in the context of a game, and this is the actual tool that people use in this field to measure the clarity of the water, um, then you'll understand why we have it. And you'll, you'll g gather data from multiple spots and then ha have to see what's the pattern in the data versus the noise. So we're giving you authentic tools while doing an investigation to see if you can make sense from the data. You then are gathering evidence to form arguments, which hopefully will improve the lake. So the first one is very simple. You're convincing this guy and his dog not to jump in the lake, um, but it gets more and more complex as you go along. So there you're talking to the kids saying, you know, please don't, don't jump in. Um, one of the fun things that we did, because we realized we were making essentially 
kind of a uh, Japanese spire inspired role playing game. And the first the first version was kind of kind of stale. And um, a student on the, on the team said, you know, we should have some spirits in there, like a lake spirit. And we're like, wow, a lake spirit? Like, yeah, you know, if you're going Japanese RPG, you need to go Japanese RPG for the kids out there who play them. So we're like, all right. So we put in the spirit of the lake. And what was fascinating is that about half the educators loved it and half hated it. They're like, oh, you're going to have a, a spirit in this? And then a couple of the postdocs said, well, you know, if you know, like the Gaia theory, it's not weird to say... There is, and of course, in many native traditions, there absolutely is something like a spirit of the lake. But in this case, they were saying, you know, I oftentimes think of there being a general health or a general spirit of the lake. So Stephen's team, Stephen Carpenter's team, was totally fine with this, which I, I found really fascinating. They said, oh, yeah, have a spirit of the lake in there. You know, we can talk about what that means, how different traditions have had that. What does it mean to have a general feeling of the lake uh, health? Um, so that's one reason we ended up including that. So what you do in the game is you form arguments, starting by saving the dog. You're then convincing boaters to um, essentially prevent exotic uh, species from coming into the lake, uh, zebra mussels. You're then convincing homeowners to plant um, buffer strips so that rainwater uh, runoff, that's a thing we have here a lot of, right? You know, you get rainwater runoff and it tears everything up. So here, convincing homeowners to do something about that. And then finally, convincing community organizers and taking it to the government to get some legislation passed. Now, this was very exciting to me, my own sort of interest in this area. You know, could we have a game where the final steps is literally seeing what would you need to do or what is one set of things you would need to do to fix a real problem in a real community where it's kind of like a blueprint for kids playing the game. Like, this, is, if you want to do something, this is what you would do, right? So here's um, a little bit more of going back in time, taking readings to seeing how these patterns have changed over time. Again, more of the Secchi disk where you see how we actually measure these things. Um, yeah, I'll skip through a little bit. Um, taking a boat out into the lake so you get a sense for what's a point source pollution versus what are overall patterns. And then, and then one of the other things that we put in there which um, uh, was, it became an interesting phenomenon because if you're into uh, well, I'll skip some of that. Um, if you're into games, you understand that a game like this can become kind of linear. And what I wanted to do was give them a simulation to play around with. So we actually created a little snow globe simulation where you could just try to mess around with like, oh, what happens if I change all the fishing regulations and deal with manure treatment? What, what happens to all the different levels of like flooding and pollution and runoff? And we called it the sort of magic snow globe. That good. Teachers love that. That was one of the most popular features. We, in some ways, we could have even skipped some of the rest, and people really wanted to have that. So in terms of what learning happened, um, we did some traditional pre-post tests, but we did what uh, John Bransford, uh, as a researcher up in um, Seattle, University of Washington, calls preparation for future learning. And what this, what this uh, theory says is that good learning events, they're useful at the time as you learn, you know, as you play a game, you might learn from it. But where they're really helpful is as you move forward, you are better able to learn more things. You might think of it as if you have, well, the theory is that if you've done this, played this game and you've done all this stuff, sure, you can pass a test. But as you start reading things in more depth, you're like, oh, I totally get this because I know why you're, I know why you're um, studying the lake. I know what a Secchi disk is. I've used it and so on and so on. So this is um, uh, called Preparation for Future Learning. And so what we did is we had pre-tests for everybody, control and experiment. We then had the control group read a packet about the lakes, whereas the, ex the experimental group played the game. We then took another test, then we flipped it. And what we found, and then we did another post-test. And what we found was that the, the um, experimental group, the game group, had um, steps right away where we saw some gains, but they noticed that they kept going up because basically once they understood kind of got the overall picture of like, oh, this is why we're learning this. That, actually, that's a lot of it that I found is just interest. Like, I care. <laughs> this is interesting. Whereas you hand someone a thing about a lake, they're like, oh, why do I care about any of this? Right. So, um, so we found that we saw some sort of learning in games. Um, so games can provide what we call a situated experience, again, a deep, rich experience that helps us in future learning experiences that we are able to learn um, deeper, more quickly, and so on. So the kinds of things I've been thinking about, even if you don't want to use games, um, even if you can't, you know, find a game that works with the curriculum, is, you know, what kinds of experiences should everyone have? You know, I would argue doing something where you're using science to make a difference in the world would be great. If everyone, by the time you've graduated, said, oh, I, you know, I'm literate in science, I'm able to participate in a democracy, because I know what that means, I know how science is made, I know how it's used to do something. Um, there's other ones you might imagine, like running a company, building a robot, 
engineering or rocket. These are the kinds of things that games can do. They can give you these kinds of situated experiences that are difficult to do other ways. Uh, so these are some of those practices I talked about beforehand. And um, there's a report on this called Learning Science Through Computer Games and Simulations. It's about 10 years ago at the time, uh, this is another National Academies publication. At the time, very few of these games existed, so this was all very speculative, and it was saying, oh, we should try these things. We're now getting to the point where you can start to find some of these games actually out there. Okay, the next one, this is the other main study I want to talk about, then I'll talk about a couple of very small things, um, is what we call place-based games. And these are some of my favorites. If I had to recommend sort of one thing to do, it probably would be this. And these are games where you're going to a specific location, and you're building a game around the environmental issues at that location. So this one, um, and you might think of this as like Pokemon Go, right? So before Pokemon Go existed, this was very tough to explain. Now it's like, imagine Pokemon Go, but instead of Pokemon, you're now talking to other uh, creatures or characters triggered by location and time. Um, so this one um, is also in, occurred in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, it's called Saving Lake Wingra. And so these are some of the interactions that you can see. But the idea is that th this lake, Lake Wingra, is dying. Some say it'll be gone by 2050. This is also a real possibility. Um, I can explain why in a second. Um, but when um, the seventh and eighth graders get this, they get a packet and it says, hey, in two weeks, the city of Madison is gonna hold hearings about what to do. Should we restore the lake? Uh, turns out that's not even really a thing. There's no one time it was restored, but that's what we want people to understand through playing the game. Should we expand parks near it? That's usually a good uh, thing they think about. Particularly, should we kind of clean up the wetlands that seem gross, but if you know about wetlands, you know that you actually, they, have, they serve a vital function. Should we improve it for boaters? We know there's some who are gonna wanna do that. Um, or my favorite sort of cynical things, oh, we should build a condos and a Starbucks on the side, because <laughs> why not? You've been hired to make your case, and you're, um, you're given one of three roles. You're an environmental historian who's gonna help understand like what has the lake been, how's it evolved, how's it changed. You're a wildlife ecologist who's gonna understand, hey, if we build that you know, condo right there, what's that gonna do to the migrating birds? Um, or a landscape architect who might come in and say, oh, well, you know, we can actually do this in a way that fits all the needs, right? Um, you work for one of the four following companies, uh, Wingra Boats, there's a boating company there that has like canoes. Uh, Friends of Lake Wingra that are, uh, oh, residents who live around there and, and are concerned about its use. Um, an outdoor club that wants more recreation, more boating, things like that. And then a condo company who is kind of our sort of uh, cynically evil developer, though they are evil. I mean, you can imagine a way of doing this actually right. Um, and that was kind of what we wanted to push them on. So there's Lake Wingra. It's next to the other Lake Mendota. There's a lot of lakes in Wisconsin. Um, and the learning goals for this were really environmental literacy. So we wanted them to do, we actually teamed up, there's a picture of them teamed up, science teachers with uh, language arts teachers. If there's another thing when I have teachers around, another sort of easy thing you can, I always tell people, is, you know, if you wanna, it's not easy, but if there's one relatively simple thing you can do is like forget the games, but if you can coordinate even your curricula so that um, you have some of the nonfiction text you're reading in class and science class be part of when uh, of what they're doing in, in literacy class, that can be a really big win. Um, that was something they did a lot of. So as you would get a text in the game, they'd say, I'm gonna help you pick apart and understand how to read that in language arts. Because language arts would say, oh, I hate teaching persuasive writing. It's the same crap we have to do every year or even teaching nonfiction text. You know, a lot of them didn't get into English language arts for that. They love literature, but they know they've got to spend a couple months on that. So what we did is combine these two. So they are learning about the ecology and then doing it for both classes. So that's them sort of team teaching. Um, this is the vocabulary, it's just kind of a wall of text, but you can get a sense of like non-point source pollution, topography. A lot of it gets into urban planning, um, which I find fascinating. Um, kids may or may not. So um, the game takes place at Lake Wingra. So you go down with your, now it would be an iPhone. Um, you go down to Lake Wingra and you walk around and you see the different ways that the, the, the lake is being contested in preparation for your presentation that you have to make. Um, so you go to the wetlands and you see what's happening there. Um, we kind of seed some things with like, oh, there's these dirty, swampy lands that you should clean up. And then that's a way to help them understand what role the wetlands play in the ecology. Um, the purple loose strife there is an invasive species that they learn about. That's actually my kid at the time with his hat. Um, you go to the, uh, well, you learn there's a zoo next door, which is not really involved in anything, but a lot of kids wonder, you know, what happens to the waste coming out of the zoo and stuff like that. There's a beach where swimming happens. 
Um, they go down to the boat rental and they see what you know what happens with the, what's the effects, the environmental effects of the boats. In this case, it's pretty negligible, but they understand how boaters are using it. Um, this guy's actually, well, I won't play it. There's a, someone pulling a fish right out of that boat rental place, which is kind of cool. So there's a lot of fishing. Um, that's actually a musky fish and something that's kind of cool. There are four feet, foot long fish in that lake um, that people pull out, which is always interesting when you see someone swimming and going, oh God, that's, that's kind of crazy coming right out of there. Um, so it's an important breeding ground for musky. And there's some interesting science experiments going on in real time that we take the kids down to see. So um, there's something called a carp exclosure wall where they built in the lake the sort of fence to keep the carp out. And you can see there from a photograph that square is actually the water clarity where it's that much more clear because there aren't carp in there kind of digging up crap. So kids actually will walk out there, see that and say, oh, wow, I see what's going on. I you know, understand maybe we should build more carp enclosures. They get to build that into their plans that they want to do. Um, there's people just using recreation, right? They kind of go out there and loaf around. Uh, my favorite little thing we uncovered, and this is what's fun if you start building local curriculum, is you find these little weird things. So in this case, for the outdoor rec club, there's a, a, a beautiful 10K uh, sort of exercise path that goes around the lake, except for that little spot right up there by the Dungeon Monroe. And that's because there's these three houses <laughs> that are right there that do not let the, the path go in front of them. And that's actually the house there. So just for fun, we kind of put that in there and say, you know, you could put in your plan that there's some sort of imminent domain, or maybe you want to build a path around it, a boardwalk, which certainly would make them mad, but you know, it's, it, it's up there for negotiation. Uh, and there's the last of the, the musky fish happening. Um, so these are the different interactions that we put there. Again, as you go to each location, you will, something will pop up telling you what's going on there. And the idea is that we want to give people information in context. So they can say, like, they might read about a carp enclosure, but then say, oh, that's, that's it right there. Like, I can actually see what's going on. They get videos of people doing research on site. They can listen to indicator species of birds so on and so on. Um, we also embed actual newspaper reports and things in the game. So this is an article about the uh, lake closures due to high bacteria counts. And it turns out that's actually from geese uh, along the side of the, of the lake. This happens, it happens a lot down um, on some of the beaches here. If you have a lot of waterfowl, they leave droppings, which can have bacteria in it and get sick. So that, that was something they learned about while playing. It's always fun to see their faces go like, oh, ooh. you know, they look around and see, it's horrible. Um, and then the real mystery behind this lake is uh, chloride levels. So this, this comes from uh, salt runoff and other runoff from all the roads. When you have an urban lake of this sort, this is usually your biggest problem. So the lake is actually disappearing and it's because of the silt and runoff. It's actually always been the case. There's always, since this lake has been there, there's been a battle between cleaning up the springs, it filling up, cleaning up the springs. It's been going on for like a hundred years. Um, the, the collaborative, if you're, uh, there's teachers out there, um, you think of jigsawing, this is something we do as teachers. The idea is that if you have, uh, each one gets their own set of documents and then they have to come together, each team has to come together, is a way of sort of uh, encouraging reading comprehension and closer reading. So it's one thing to say, here, read this, but it's another thing to say, well, you're the wildlife ecologist, your team needs you to know what's in there. In order to have a winning plan, you've actually got to kind of make sense of it and share it with them. So each one gets their own unique information, and this is a game mechanic that we've used a lot of. So well, a lot of people ask, how do you use this in schools? Um, one of our middle school uh, classes did this, and I think this is really the right way to go. So on day one, they started by playing citizen science, right? So they played that game. They did a couple of weeks, a couple of days on that. Outside the game for homework, they had reading activities, so on and so on. Um, they next, when they finished that unit, they went and played Saving Lake Wingrove. So they did a whole nother unit on this lake to say, okay, you've learned about one lake, but here's a different one that acts very different. It's got a different set of environmental conditions, um, but let's try to expand what you know. Um, there are, there's more discussions, more maps, and so on. They then designed their own local study because they had a lake in their sort of backyard and say, okay, well, let's, what's going on there? Um, let's figure out what are some of the issues reading, planning, and so on. And then the last phase is building models, analyzing, trying to make a case. Um, we've had this happen twice where st students will find something out that they actually go to their city council and present their information and findings. Um, we've had two different versions where that happened, one around science and one around history, which to me is really cool. So you're saying, all right, you know, in order to graduate, you should have had the experience of doing something that matters in the world, like going to present this in front of, um, 
in front of a group. Um, one, one of my more sort of proud moments, I guess, is a teacher and researcher was um, one, one, at one point I opened up the, re the newspaper and found this, which is a letter to the editor written by one of the students. So the, the uh, newspaper had a special issue about lakes and lake health and what should we do? Because um, it's, it's just, it's kind of a perennial issue there. And the student wrote a letter saying, I personally think that we wouldn't have to give any money exactly to the lakes but we could give the money to schools. And I'm like, what is he talking about? Oh, he's one of our kids. Why? It's pretty straightforward. Schools could use the money to afford trips to the lakes so we could learn more about the disaster of the lakes. Now, I've been thinking, how could this save the lakes? Could do many things. I might be astonished by the news, become inspired to volunteer to save the lakes, blah, blah, blah. So this is kind of the outcome we're looking for, right? Of people saying, oh, I'm interested in it. I'm going to take action. I'm going to kind of help. Um, now, I want to um, really quickly to wrap up, go through two brief examples of how this might port beyond games. So these are both, this, these are things I really sort of love and would recommend. And we can talk about how you can actually make this kind of thing um, more scalable. Um, but there are two different ways we tried to build on this. Um, this one is called Trails Forward. And the idea is, um, you know, the saving Lake Winger is great, but the problem is you can't play it all the time. You can't get people from the community to play with the kids. It's kind of locked into the classroom. And what I'm really interested in, and one reason I love games, like if you play World of Warcraft or you play Minecraft, you could have someone who's a PhD in computer science playing alongside a 10 year old. And as long as they can play the game together, like they're in, they can play together, they learn together. There's a leveling, right? And a lot of the learning happens when you have someone who's more able playing next to someone who's younger. And that's like a natural form of learning. It happens in games all the time. So we thought, could we try to build a game where you could have the same kinds of environmental stuff? In this case, you're playing in Lake, we at least moved to a different county. And this is a Vilas County in Northern Wisconsin. But you're playing as loggers, developers, and conservationists, all the same kinds of ideas. Um, but you could actually have it, it's online, so you have students, researchers, and gamers going together. Um, without getting too deep into it, this is a very deep simulation where it's an entire county, so we've modeled an entire county down to the acre with different land types, tree density, species, size, housing, um, and they're seeded with accurate data, so we, we calculated the actual property values, but as you do things, it actually changes. So as you go in and say, um, chop down land, it's going to affect the property values. Or if you cut down all of the um, forest around, um, around uh, a lake or river, it's going to affect the, the, the chemistry of the lake. So the game cycle is buying and selling property, then lobbying for roads where you want roads to go or zoning changes. When you try to make a realistic game, so this is a little bit like, if any of you have heard of Fold It that was out a couple years ago, it's a game for protein folding. The idea is you're building with real data and trying to affect real life processes. You're kind of limited then for your game verbs into doing real life stuff. So in real life, when you're doing like logging, your main verbs are buying and selling property, trying to get roads put in or changing the zoning laws. So this is what the developers can do. They can bulldoze their land, they can build homes, they can build factories, um, they can't go willy nilly. Here's someone chopping down their forest. Um, the loggers can bid on their land. They can choose logging vehicles and types. Again, one of the, the, the tricks and why this game, a game like this may never end up in schools is that once you get into the nitty gritties of logging, it turns out like for the loggers, it really matters if you're using a 2012 Prentice 2190 versus a 1986 Rotney Forwarder because the way that they log is really different. It's going to affect drastically what happens. So um, one of the... Um, reasons this, we use it in, school, in schools a little bit, but one reason it never really took off is that our teachers joked, they're like, if I want a logging training simulation, this is great, but it's, it's, you're not really getting at those bigger, more generalizable ideas. Was, this was kind of the, the, the findings we found from that. Um, but there were some cool moments around like endangered species sightings and how do you deal with that within the game. So the, the students did engage in complex practices. Um, they did a lot of mapping activities. You know, as they started playing the game, they started going back and forth the maps. Um, another student, uh, so students became very interested in this thing called the American Martin, which is a little animal I'll show you in a second. And they started developing uh, methods to try to understand how many different martins could they fit in their forest. Um, it's this little guy, right? So no wonder they did. This guy's ridiculously cute. Speaking of Pokemon, he's like something out of a Pokemon. Um, and one of the interesting findings that came out of this is that one of our uh, PhD students was actually able to do a dissertation using this game as a simulation, right? So this, using this game model, he ran a bunch of simulations, 
watched what people did in the game and came up with a model for understanding what are the best ways to reintroduce this. So this game hasn't taken off, but there's a whole class and model of games that we're hoping will happen, where basically, you know, you get all these people together, you play through it a bunch, and then people say, oh, I understand, you know, the best way to use this land. Like, what are the best ways to know where you log, where you don't log? So people kind of come to a shared understanding of how we can take better care of our resources. Um, I'm gonna skip over this real quick and jump to the last one. And this is the last one where we took that experience and said, all right, I, I guess we understand, it's almost like giving someone a weather map and you're trying to say, oh, I understand now how the weather works. It's just too way, way too complicated. So we decided we, for our, our final sort of project, we would come up with a relatively simple game. Um, John, our developer over there said, you want me to make this a game game? I said, yeah, let's like make this clear game. And we're gonna market to kids to play it on their own, just because it's fun. You know, it's always hard to get these things in schools anyway. So let's just try to make something that's really fun and cool. So this was called Econauts, a very simple uh, multiplayer RTS, real-time strategy game, sorry. And the idea is that kids have, again, three roles. You can see we're trying to learn from our mistakes or successes. Um, some are miners, some are farmers, some are loggers. They're playing on this, literally in this case, the same lake. It's also a simulation. Um, we're calling it Trout Lake, but it's, it's Lake Mendota. Um, there's a simulation underneath, so we're doing the same algae, industrial wastes, pollutions, phosphates, all the same agricultural runoff kind of stuff. But they are playing, uh, and this is a, just uh, a very complex slide to show you, oh yeah, there's a model. <laughs> so it's, this is the model, and depending on where you chop down trees, the pollutants are going to flow differently. But again, he wanted us to really make it a game. So we made you know, characters cute, approachable, um, there's a, embedded tutorials as you go through. Um, and as you go through, you, you're basically, if you're the farmer, you're trying to generate as much money as you can to win the game. But you are playing against a miner who's trying to do the same thing. The miner is building mines and then also building factories. And then there's a lumberjack who's trying to chop down trees and process wood. And in the process of doing all these things, you run into the same problems, right? So if you chop down the trees around a watershed, uh, you're going to get um, more agricultural runoff. So as a result, the players have to start negotiating. And this is what would happen after the first game. Say, oh, wait, hold on. If, if I've got a farm out there and you chop down your trees, that's now going to cause pollutants. So they need to start coming up with tacit agreements. Um, and um, well, yeah, and so you can see we have both players having their own individual goals, like making as much money as you can, trying to uh, build your own company but then at the same time, rewarding those who are like pursuing conservation goals. And what we found was that kids through playing this game basically discovered the rules of good management, right? So as you play through this game a couple times, you realize, oh, it matters where you plant, where you have trees, where you, where you, plant, where you um, leave buffer strips and so on. So um, this was to me was really encouraging, the fact that they're playing this just for fun, they thought this was really cool, and they were coming up with their own observations about that. Uh, of all the games, this was the most fun. About 20% of, of them went and played at home on their own. And you can see them starting to build their own levels. Um, and the system is built so you could do like desert scenarios and so on. Um, one of the things we really did have to do um, is jack up some of the, the um, algae. So that's like algae and fish die-offs. Again, almost like the salt and sea, if you've seen that, to help kids get it. So um, to pull back around and kind of wrap up, you know, if, if something we ran into in the pandemic is this sort of sequestered learning where everyone's on their own, you are taking information from like a PowerPoint or reading and then you're spitting it back without a big sense of co of presence, you know, you're kind of at home doing this. Games uh, are good at doing things like giving you a sense of co-presence, place, agency, going outside and so on. Um, but I think something I learned looking at this, because I, you know, as we tried to, as I tried to do some of this in my own classes even, uh, and this is what I'd love to have, I'd love to hear more from you all on this, is that in some ways, we have the school system we want in the sense that, you know, our school systems are very competitive. Um, you know, we have a lot of what they are set up to do right now is what people in education have uh, called for decades now, sorting machines, where what they're really good at doing is helping, um, you know, sorting out people by various social class and giving some people, functioning as gatekeepers to things like college, right? It's really tough within the context of schools, given all the pressures that we have for content coverage, for getting people ready, you know, to go to college, to do anything that really bends on this. So I think most likely what you're going to see um, is 
things like this coming up in after school programs, that's where we've had the most success. I think that's probably right now where they belong. Like I'd have a hard time going to a school and saying, you know, I know you're working really hard. You're trying to cover all of this stuff. You've got all these technology constraints. You're trying to cram everything in. You have standardized tests. I want you to take away the things you're doing and stick a game in, right? So right now I think after schools, summer programs are the most logical place. Um, I think, um, and then something else that we did learn from doing this is the moment you go to a school and say, hey, you're gonna play a game where you can play online with anyone from all over the world, the school's like, are you kidding me? No, we are not letting, <laughs> during the school day, you cannot talk to other people through your computer. Um, but the other thing um, I, I guess I wanna say, and this has been my shock kind of moving from Wisconsin to California, is that, you know, if you look, these are some, uh, just some slides about the general equity and income gaps right now. So the one on the left is income, the one on the right is wealth. I think one of the reasons that we're seeing all of these concerns are that people, including like say the affluent, know that it's really hard to sort of stay ahead right now in America, right? So people are really focused on those tangible outcomes of exchange value, like show me how this is going to raise standardized test scores down the road. And I think that's, um, in, including e even at the expense, right, of these other values that we know as science educators, we've said we've wanted that correlate with future careers and things like that. Um, the, um, uh, well, the last two slides, I guess, really quick, then I'll wrap up. Um, something I wrote a little bit about coming out of the pandemic was that it was clear to me as a parent talking to other teachers, students in other districts is that there were a lot of different forms of capital to some extent our kids already had. And what I mean by that are just access resources. So a kid like ours who are kind of, you know, relatively lucky, I guess, have all of this stuff. You just take the picture of them during pandemic, right? They've got a desk where they can work with something like a computer, even if it's an older one, there's a computer there they can use. They're not having to wrestle their brothers for it. Um, there's a room that's got a door so you can shut it. Like that was something else I heard a lot of people saying, like, I would love to do that, but I, you know, I don't, I don't have that sort of sound privacy. I share a room, right? Um, was, plus when they needed it, someone got them like a microphone and all that crap, printers, right? The human capital, if you're a parent during this phase, something you experienced a lot of is tutoring, help tech, even just emotional support, like I can't do this anymore, I'm gonna break down. You're like, no, 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 you know, you can do it. These are things if you've got someone with a flexible schedule who can help, um, which many people who are, you know, where all the adults are working trying to keep things going, that's not a thing they have. This other, uh, there's a, a neighbor of ours transformed their garage into a working area, which again is awesome, but not everyone has that kind of access. And then the final one was structural capital, which I also got a little bit fascinated by, which is the idea when you've got like planners like this, and methods where it's like, oh, you know, you're gonna take a break every so often, or in order to get up and play games, you've gotta show me you've got this much work done, which is something, all of these things were things that our schools in the, the affluent areas were kind of already doing, right? They already, they already gave you so much homework. You kind of had to have a computer. They already had like, cause our kids have like three hours of homework and you already had to do this stuff, which I, again, I grew up in Indiana. We did not, it was not this competitive, right? <laughs> you, you did maybe, you did some homework maybe. Um, Whereas here, it's like, no, 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 they're really forcing, you're really forced to work sort of this hard. Um, so I think what's gonna happen is you're gonna see games like this, again, in camps, clubs, uh, maybe college prep programs. Um, I think you see some degree of affluent people using these technologies already to advantage their kids. Um, you could imagine colleges um, building more programs. Um, we thought we would do more of that. One of the challenges you find are that colleges just aren't really set up to do this. Um, uh, we do more of it here in California than people do other places, but it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to set this up for a variety of reasons. Um, and then in terms of future things I'm interested in, of course, there's the AI stuff that just, this just came out today. The GT, GPT-4 is crazy. My brother was calling me on the way over, like, you've got to see this thing. Um, so some of my questions are, you know, if we are going to have schools that are kind of locked into this getting people ready to get to college, where they're not having as many opportunities to ask their own questions, lead their own investigations, uh, learn new things independently on their own. Uh, when from my experience in the workforce, like I, so I teach in games, the games program, the games industry flips over every five years so that the languages and platforms you use are not gonna be the same five or seven years ago from now. So people have to retrain, they shift jobs every 18 months, they're always learning, it's high, again, it's highly competitive. Um, but it's a very different, like the whole idea that you learn everything you need to learn and then you're gonna be fine is like not true at all, right? So um, something I'm interested in is how, how, 
what are the different ways that people need to learn and have these dispositions, like learning to teach themselves new things? And are there ways we can then think about how that's gonna fit within schooling? Those are the questions I have moving forward. Um, but I'm really curious about what sense any of you make of any of this. And so I think we've got some time for questions. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Thanks, Kurt. Mm -hmm. Ah, that was my last slide.